So today we're going to be talking about uh, the staking economy and how it's moving from monolithic to modularity. Uh, we're going to introduce our uh, speakers here. I'm the host, Victor Bunyan. <laughs> Big supporters over there. Um, I got a taste for Colombia. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So um, we have a, an amazing panel before us. Um, to introduce myself, I'm protocol specialist at Coinbase Cloud. Coinbase Cloud is an infrastructure provider. Uh, we run validators and, and nodes across something like 30 or 40 different blockchains at this point. Uh, we run uh, a good number of ETH, uh, ETH validators. Um, and so we're extremely invested in the success of Ethereum ecosystem, we're paying a lot of attention to this transition from the, um, you know, what is currently a validator, which is a, you know, it's, it's a box somewhere that has some software on it. The keys are either there or in some other box. Um, and it's pretty vanilla. And it, go, it goes and it does its work and it you know, performs the consensus duties. Uh, but the trend that we're seeing right now is that there's a whole host of essentially middleware solutions that are changing uh, and, and modularizing the validator experience. And so they're almost kind of like plugins or, or extensions you can think of it as. It's a very crude uh, example. Um, this is a fairly recent phenomenon. Um, you know, Flashbots and, and MevBoost was, you know, the first and primary example of it, you know, reaching uh, an enormous scale within the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, but with the advancements coming from, you know, the teams up, up, up here and also other teams working in the space, uh, we expect for this to be um, an extremely exciting uh, and, and pivotal moment in the development of blockchain infrastructure on Ethereum. And so, with that, uh, I'm going to pass it over to the panelists to each introduce themselves and their projects. Uh, we're going to give them a little bit of time to uh, not go super technical, but like it's important you understand what like each project is because it's really going to inform the rest of the conversation. And these are nuanced, uh, meaty topics. And so, the directive we gave them is a, is a VC pitch, but a VC that knows what's going on, you know. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so with that, Stefan, please go ahead. All right, hello, hello. All right, this works. Hey everyone, I'm Stefan. Um, until recently was at Flashbots. Um, one of the big things I've been working on there over the last year has been developing and shipping MevBoost, which uh, is often talked about these days. So I'm happy to uh, get into it, get into like discussing what it means to develop this kind of software for validators. Um, you know, MevBoost was developed to help solve two very specific problems with regards to um, to validator deployments and MEV. One was allowing access to solo validators to participate in the MEV market. Um, and the other one was to protect client diversity and sort of avoid a future where, um, you know, validators would try to fork their own code and create some uh, some technical debt in integrating new, uh, new upgrades. So the way that it's architected and the way that it works today is anyone running a validator, whether it's at home or a massive uh, node operator like Coinbase Cloud, can, um, can plug in MevBoost into their system, do some minor configuration, and essentially run it out of the box and, and get uh, uh, better rewards. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the intro there. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Sriram. Uh, I'm founder of this project called Eigenlayer and uh, also run the University of Washington Blockchain Research Lab. Um, what we're doing at Eigenlayer is essentially enabling the sharing of decentralized trust from Ethereum staking to anybody who wants to build a new system on top. So the core idea here is staking is the root of trust. So when you're, you know, after the merge, you know, we are in a proof of stake world where no, uh, you, the uh, stakers basically put down a stake and commit to black block validation. And if they make an error or if they behave maliciously, they can lose the stake. So this underwrites a certain economic security into the blockchain. What we are doing is enabling it to be flexibly shared. So for example, you put down your stake and restake. So restake is a new concept we came up with. Restake is the idea that you're using the same stake, putting it at additional risk, and committing to doing additional things. Maybe running a new chain, running a new service like data availability, running other middlewares on top of this common stake. So 
the exchange here is stakers are taking on additional responsibilities and additional risk. And in exchange, they're compensated with some fees or other tokens which are paid for those stakers. Imagine you want to build a new distributed system. You have to go around and try to create a whole new validation network, which is decentralized, fund economic security to it, which is actually very, very expensive. For example, just to get a sense of numbers here, Ethereum has like, you know, $20 billion worth of economic uh, stake at risk. If you wanted to build a platform which has similar economic security, you're talking about like, you have to pay the stakers an annual APR like 10%, right? That's like $2 billion worth of fees just for your other system to be as secure as Ethereum. It's virtually impossible. So what you can do is you can borrow this massive economic security because you're restaking it, you're using it for additional services. Anybody can come and build new services on top, thus augmenting the feature set of the Ethereum ecosystem. We think of this as a permissionless way to do feature addition to Ethereum. So in you're borrowing the Ethereum trust and now running new services. It is purely opt-in from the staker side. It's not forced on anybody, but the stakers that do opt-in are actually able to earn this additional risk reward dynamic. So that's what we do at EigenLayer. Hey everyone, uh, Colin Myers, uh, co-founder of Obel. We are focused on building what's called distributed validators. Um, easiest way to describe what a distributed validator is, is today all validators are seen as one key, one entity, one individual. Uh, it's very singular in nature. Uh, our primary goal with DVT is to enable and change everyone's minds that validators can become communities. So with DVT, what you can do, uh, you can take a regular validator, you can use a DKG, divide up its key into different shares, and the four of us today can share a validator together. And if Victor's house burns down, all things are fine because we use threshold signing and applied cryptography. So our node will keep going, it'll keep validating, the network will not halt. Um, and yeah, that's what we're focused on. It takes on the form of a middleware uh, and it sits on the ETH2 side. Awesome. And uh, I know you folks are all starting out on Ethereum and you talk a lot about Ethereum. But obviously, it's not the only proof-of-stake network that's out there. Um, there's a proliferation of them, and most networks these days are proof-of-stake. Um, how do you think about the trade-offs of sticking to Ethereum versus also starting to work on other layer ones or you know, layer twos and um, other ecosystems? I think right now there's a huge narrative of like the bazaar versus the app chain. Uh, I think they can both live and survive. Um, I'm an American that spends half my time in Europe, and it's actually almost culturally how the world is divided. Like Europe is kind of a bazaar. Uh, all their cities are meant to be lived in. Everything is close to each other. America's like app chains, suburbs, houses, everything's real structured and together. Um, so the way that we look at that is uh, Ethereum is the bazaar. Uh, and then who's the app chain? Um, so for us, as we look at where to take DVT, it, it needs to fit technically within that network. Uh, and what's favorable for us are not too fast at block times because uh, there's rounds of communication that need to go between the individuals that are inside of a cluster. Um, so for us, Cosmos is like another chain that where that could work and is kind of the app chain model. Uh, they have five to seven second block times. Uh, for us to work on other chains, DVT works best with BLS signatures. Um, they're homomorphically additive, uh, which enables you to split them up and then re-aggregate them and broadcast in a very efficient manner. Uh, Cosmos does not have that. Um, Maybe they will adopt it, or maybe DVT can be fit into another chain um, in that sense. But today, we are most focused on Ethereum. Uh, however, DVT is something that all public blockchains should use, in my opinion, to add like more resiliency and add fault tolerance to the network. Uh, so it comes down to demand. It comes down to like where the economic value is. It comes down to like where the smartest minds are. Um, and I do believe that outside of the bazaar, the app chain model uh, is probably the only other layer one that would compete with Ethereum. And, that's how we currently look at the option set. Very cool. Um, we are uh, primarily Ethereum centric. And the reason is when you want to build a layer like this, you are basically looking for where is the maximum pool of decentralized trust. Because we are basically a decentralized trust marketplace. Where do you have maximum economic security? Where do you have maximum decentralization? How can we leverage this? and build a whole bunch of new technologies on top of it. So our attention is actually in onboarding newer and newer modules and technologies. 
And one interesting thing that, you know, if you look at Ethereum versus the other blockchains, Ethereum has committed itself to the modular blockchain world. And I think very few people understand the kind of scope of what a modular blockchain world is. Uh, the way to think about it is one thing we all love, you know, across all these ecosystems about blockchain is permissionless composability, right? You can build an app and I can build something on top of it and somebody else can build something on top of it. Together, they stand much stronger than any one person could have ever built. And permissionless composability is at the app layer and that's how all smart contract systems work. But we want to bring permissionless composability at the distributed system level. You build a new system, I build a data availability layer, you build a broadcast layer, somebody else builds uh, some other thing on top, you know, an authentication layer, you just pack all of these together and then create a new service. So Ethereum, having committed to this modular paradigm where you know, there is going to be different things done at different modules rather than all bundled together, we're all about unbundling trust, right? So we are actually taking the trust network and letting people innovate on the different modules. So for us, it is a natural fit that Ethereum is the right place to build something like this. For MEV, okay. Um... Deciding where to build MEV solutions sort of comes from the starting point of where is the biggest problem. And the biggest problem is where you know the most usage is. So it sort of makes sense to start from that perspective with Ethereum. Um, and it turns out that building MEV solutions is kind of hard. So you kind of solve it, you, you, you build something on one layer, and then you say, well, it would be nice to go build it on everywhere else, but there's only so much time in, uh, and resources to be able to do it. So the other thing is, it's not a, a one-size-fits-all solution. So I think there's some principles, there's some abstractions, there's some research, some ideas that can be reused across multiple different places, but um, you can't just reuse the model that you deploy for a, uh, a, certain, um, a certain node architecture for a certain client architecture and copy-paste it into other chains. Um, it's been really cool to see other teams emerge in other ecosystems that try to solve similar MEV problems at the middleware layer, at the node customization layer. Um, I know on the Solana side, right, the Jito team has been working on it for, for a little while, and it's fascinating to see how different the solution space is. Right? So it's sort of the solution that they are coming up with to be able to outsource the um, the MEV extraction is actually to slow down block times. So um, because Solana has this main difference of being so much faster at block production than, um, than Ethereum, to do any meaningful outsourcing, you need to have slower time, block time, so that you can add the network latency that's required. Um, and so it sort of highlights that even though the principle is the same, the idea of being able to outsource MEV extraction from the validator level the implementation ends up looking completely different. Um, you know, the other thing that I'll, I'll note is like, MevBoost is surprisingly simple software. You know, like running a consensus client, uh, doing all the peering and the networking is really difficult. MevBoost is just like a plugin that is a sidecar to the system and allows it to connect to a bunch of other uh, uh, resources for receiving blocks. Um, it's just a multiplexer of like an RPC call. Um, yet it's so hard to get adopted, right? Like such a finite, such a small change, which you'd say like, okay, like anyone could implement this in like a day and, and ship it is not that trivial when you're like deploying it to a network with four, you know, 430,000 or so nodes. There's so many different stakeholders involved, so many different interests. And the hardest part of developing this kind of software is not the technology itself. It's also being embedded into the ecosystem, understanding what are the goals that are being achieved by the development of this software. What are both the technical but social goals as well, as well as economic interests of all the parties involved. And that's where 90% you know, of the work of developing these kinds of uh, solutions lies. It's, it's not necessarily just the technical side. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's such a good point. And um, I think that's something that unless you spend time in multiple ecosystems, it's very easy to take it for granted that people, you know, outside of your ecosystem have the same worldview about what's fair and like what should happen and who should benefit or, or not benefit from certain activities. And what we find is that, you know, you can't copy paste MevBoost because, you know, other ecosystems don't want necessarily these characteristics, right? And so the software just like doesn't make sense as, as it is. Um, 
but there, you know, I think Shriram especially, you know, talked about some of the some of the use cases, kind of like off the cuff. But um, something that I would like to do is just make this a little bit more real of like what can all of this look like longer term. And so what I'd love it is if you could, if you guys could like talk about like what are the most ambitious use cases that you're thinking about um, that you could potentially solve or, or address. Like what does that look like? Um, so on our side. Any type of validator can use DVT. Um, you can be big, you can be small, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, what we find most interesting is that using its cryptographic properties to partner professionals with non-professionals. Um, so when it comes to like, how do you decentralize a liquid staking pool? Um, today, most of the pools are uh, run by professional validators um, or they are run by the pool themselves. Um, and over time, what you must do is uh, include other people into that validator set. And with DVT, um, you can get the consistent uptime rewards and performance um, by pairing someone up with a professional in that capacity. So uh, today, like, let's say there's a four node cluster. Um, it can be a figment, it can be a Coinbase cloud, and it could be two at-home validators. Uh, and if applied cryptography works the way that it should, um, that validator should have just as much performance um, and it enables the small person to come in with the big person and then maybe become the big person eventually. Um, so taking a node and mixing its constituents between professional and at home uh, is kind of the, not the tail end of what we're going for, uh, but right now it sits at the most innovative spectrum of how we're testing with people and how we're looking to push it forward. Um, from our end, uh, the, the main thing we are uh, quite uh, fascinated about is the ability for the Ethereum ecosystem to become much richer. We can start listing out like the top five problems in the Ethereum uh, ecosystem, and then like start ticking off how we can solve all of them just by using Eigenlayer. We'll give some examples. Number one, the data availability bandwidth on Ethereum. So in the roll-up centric roadmap, computation is offloaded, but data availability still happens on Ethereum. So the data availability bandwidth of Ethereum, even with upcoming upgrades, will be in say 80, 90 kilobytes per second. So when you have a bandwidth like this, the rollups are of course extremely optimized to actually take advantage of this and still pump in like tens of thousands of transactions per second, so that is awesome. But in a world where we are imagining a lot of the uh, digital intermediation fundamentally happens through things like blockchains, we want to make sure that there is abundant bandwidth. You know, 80 kilobytes per second is not enough. Ethereum itself has a roadmap for, with some really interesting ideas called dunk sharding, where you can increase this up to like 1.3 megabytes per second. But even that we feel, and that's a few years out, and we feel this is not enough. There are applications which will need much, much more. And we are provisioning, uh, the first service we're building on top is a data availability solution on top of Eigenlayer, which can actually scale the throughput of data availability quite significantly. We are in our internal devnet at 15 megabytes per second already, and I think we can scale this another 100x in the coming years. This is one example of taking one pain point in Ethereum and then figuring out how new distributed systems methods can actually come in and solve these things. We build, we stand on the shoulder of giants. We build on top of dunk sharding, some of the best ideas out there. Just good engineering and open permissionless competition. This has done a lot of good to the layer two world, you know, compared to what sharding was, where one solution has to be enshrined. And there's a lot of internal contesting on which is the right solution. Whereas a permissionless competition for each of these different features actually leads to a very, very powerful world. So another example, um, people think a lot about whether we'll be in a single chain world or a multi-chain world. And I think this is not a very relevant discussion for what we are doing. Why? Because it, even in a multi-chain world, it's very clear to us that Ethereum will be at the center of this multi-chain world. And why is that? What is the center of a multi-chain world is a no, the, if you think of each blockchain as like a node and it's like a graph, you see that the hub node of this network is Ethereum. It is the most connected. It is the most liquid and the most secure. These are the three properties you need for a hub node of a multi-chain world. And we feel Ethereum is the right hub node. And so in, in this paradigm, there are some lacking things. You know, we see a lot of bridge hacks, for example. And can we think about how we can build like very powerful bridges on top of the Ethereum landscape? So that's another thing you can do is you, once you restake, you can opt in and start running 
um, like client bridges for all other chains and start bringing in very powerful uh, inputs into Ethereum. Another example. You can think of other things like MEV management, right? Like you, you want to do MEV management when, you're, uh, when, a, when a block proposer is making a claim that I'm going to follow this ordering rule, what makes them hold to that rule? If they can restake on eigenlayer and then opt in to new slashing conditions for what they have particularly agreed into, like I'm following this threshold encryption, I'm following this auction model, whatever the new rules are that you opt into, you can hold by it because you can make credible commitments on eigenlayer. Some examples of what I think we can do. Yeah, I, I also think we can just cancel the rest of DevCon. He got it. <laughs> eigenlayer will solve everything. <laughs> it will. I have a question about eigenlayer. Um, <laughs> how should like validators think about the risk? So like, intuitively to me, there's like, okay, I have my stake. I... We're, we're going to get to that. Oh, no, I, I, I'm saving the spiciest ones for the end. You want to do, do it now? We can All do right, spicy fine. ones now. All right. I'll do spicy ones now. We can do spicy ones now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's do it. But, 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 but here's, the, here's the condition. The spiciness actually applies to each of you, not just eigenlayer. And I want to hear about the risks associated with each project and the failure cases that are possible. Have you changed your mind? <laughs> Where do we start? <laughs> Well, I, I think um, you know maybe I'll, I'll I'll give like a little bit of background in that you know when you think about a middleware solution that does one thing right so today a lot of people run flashbots right they, they run MevBoost um, as part of their validators and they're able to participate in the flashbots um, software and ecosystem and and all, all that and the nice thing is that because it's like relatively simple software that doesn't make like tremendous changes from otherwise expected get behavior. It's fairly well understood, and we understand the risk parameters. We understand how it interacts with relays and the failure cases there. Uh, but you know what we don't understand is like if you're running Flashbots and you're running Eigenlayer and you're staking there, and also you're part of Obol, right? And so your validator key is split into four, for example. And so that that actually um, creates a very powerful situation where you can have these like incredibly robust and performant and like do everything type validators. But at the same time, it's also a very scary situation because of the risks involved of like, okay, now you have, you know, nine client teams that are doing different things and you have three middleware solutions and you have upgrades across all of them happening all the time. Um, and so the risk there starts to compound. And so that's some of the background that, that we're thinking about. And so maybe there's gonna be two questions here. One, I'd love to hear about, you know, what are the risks and failure cases associated with what you guys are building? Like what's the, you know, worst case scenarios that, that can happen and how are you trying to prevent it? And then the second thing that I'd love for us to talk about as a group is like, okay, you know, we are, um, you know, all marching and all kind of like making upgrades and, and doing all the things. If I'm a validator that is going to be using all of your softwares, right, and also something else, right, how do we make sure I don't get slashed? How do we make sure that the Ethereum network remains performant? How do we make sure that your development processes or testing or, or whatnot are, you know, in sync between all of you and also the other clients that are using, such as the execution or, or consensus clients? So it's a big meaty topic. Let's, who wants to go first? Um, I'll start with uh, block times. We talked about this earlier. Um, so first and foremost, like long block times in Ethereum are super important for all this entire middleware renaissance is what we're calling it internally. Um, you have these core client teams that have been built up over time. Um, they're funded by the EF. It's free software. It's the MVP viable way that you access the network. And now it's time to like build enhanced functionality on top of that. Um, those middlewares must be designed in a credibly neutral manner. They must be designed with like simple modes of failure. Um, for us on our side of the equation, you know, the biggest mode of failure. Uh, well, first of all, like what is the number one reason why everyone's been slashed to date in the network? Uh, it's because everyone's been running a configuration called active passive redundancy. Uh, it means to uh, get more effectiveness or more uptime. Um, you run the same key in two places. One is online, one is offline. This can result in like lots of false positives. Um, so you can't have a highly available validator without DVT, basically. Um, so first and foremost, DVT addresses the number one slashable event in the network to date um, by being able to give you more availability. So when designing the middleware, uh, modes of failure for us today are missing, you know, just miss your duties. Um, and then you take your time and you bring your machine back online. Uh, and that really only happens if, if, you, le if you lose more than 33% of the nodes in your cluster, right? So we're talking seven of 10, uh, we're talking three of four uh, in different combinations like this. 
Um, we'll be giving a talk tomorrow, Oshin and I, um, around how to design DVT at scale while not increasing correlation. So today, now where we're at with DVT is like, uh, correlated slashing is one of the worst things that can happen in the network. We try to like avoid that at all costs. Um, we believe that um, liquid staking pools in DVT will like reign predominant uh, inside of these. So it's our duty and responsibility to make sure that it's designed in a manner that doesn't increase correlation. Because the worst thing that can happen is uh, a correlated slashing event takes place across 80% uh, of the network who's running the same middleware. Um, Obel is a security middleware, right? It's, it's different than MEV Boost, where you use MEV Boost to get more. Uh, with Obel, you use it to protect yourself, uh, which in theory will probably earn you more uh, as well. Um, so today, when it comes to correlation, that's our biggest focus on testing. Uh, we think it's probably the biggest um, risk of the whole future of staking is making sure that correlated slashing events don't take place. Um, and yeah, that's where we're at. Awesome. What's the biggest risk of using Eigenlayer? There are many risks. <laughs> as yeah. many as things it fixes? Or? <laughs> <laughs> We've tried. Um, so there are really two kinds of uh, major failure modes. One is you, know, you get a whole bunch of uh, stakers collude. And they're not only attacking the core protocol, but also attacking all these other services. So the potential profit from actually your attack has increased because you have a much higher exposure. That's number one. I think this is, uh, even though this is somewhat significant, I think it can be addressed uh, quite, uh, uh, quite well. And the basic uh, paradigm for why this can be addressed well is we have to compare existing systems to this new upgrade using Eigenlayer. Imagine you're running a uh, a whole bunch of dApps, and all of them depend not only on Ethereum for service, but also they depend on some Oracle uh, bridging service and a few other things. That's exactly how the ecosystem is today. And even though Ethereum is giving you very strong security guarantees in terms of the economic security, you have all these other dependencies which do not have uh, you know, uh, the same, same level of economic security or decentralization built in. And you're only as safe, the dApps are only as safe as the weakest link. And by restaking, the ETH stakers, for example, if you know, just to give some numbers, if there's 20 billion at stake in ETH, but like there's not, there are three middlewares, each of them have like 1 billion at stake, you just attack the weakest pool and you can actually potentially completely corrupt all the inputs. And the alternative universe is where uh, ETH stakers all opt in to provide these services. Especially if these services are lightweight or scaled horizontally, then it's possible that a lot of ETH stakers will opt in. And when you have a lot of ETH stakers opting in, you are essentially, to corrupt any one service, to corrupt any one dApp, you have to corrupt a majority of the ETH stakers. And they're putting themselves at slashing risk. At some point, this becomes infeasible. There is a hardening of security. You want to take $20 billion of a flash loan and go and you know stake and get burned for $10 billion and going to extract more than that? It's very difficult. So when you have a lot of restaking happening, actually your system's net security increases significantly relative to that, where we are today. OK, the counterpart to this is the other kind of risk, which is what happens if there are programming errors? OK. You have a bunch of these services that are running. One of these servers has like a bug, or even worse, it's maliciously designed to break the entire network. You know, somebody is offering a 20% yield, things we have seen before, and everybody opts in. And at the end of the day, there is some you know massive slashing event at the end of this thing. All each stakers are slashed, and there is mayhem. This is our worst nightmare. Okay, how do we solve this? Um, I think this is, a, this is, you know, to to get a good analogy, at least, you know, in the Ethereum ecosystem, there has been a lot of thought in how to create systems that are immutable and ossified. And uh, the right approach to this is to start with training wheels, like layer two solutions today. And you have these training wheels where you have governance mechanisms which can backstop risks. And, and that's the same thing we'll do. So essentially, there are two grades of services on Eigenlayer. One grade of service in which there is what we call a slashing veto. There is a committee of Ethereum community members. This is not a token DAO, which you can buy out. 
This is reputed Ethereum community members, including people building on top. In this committee, they can veto slashing events which happen illegitimately, right? So slashing happens, it doesn't get actuated, there's a gap, and in this gap... And, and, and actually, and I'll, and I'll clarify there, because one thing that I can, you know, when we say slashing, it's not necessarily slashing on the Ethereum blockchain itself, it's slashing via the eigenlayer protocol. And so what it does is that your ETH that you have staked, it essentially gets withdrawn to an eigenlayer smart contract, and the eigenlayer smart contract confiscates some or all of that ETH, depending on the slashing condition that you triggered as part of eigenlayer. So it's like slashing conditions on top of slashing conditions, depending on like which rules of the protocol you break. And so that's, that's what he's referring to. Absolutely. Um, so the governance committee can veto slashing on top of eigenlayer. And this prevents things like these risk contagions. But as these protocols evolve and they have been well tested in the wild, they can ossify themselves to another grade, which is not subject to any slashing veto. So the, the only thing that the governance committee can do is to veto slashing. They cannot add on new slashing. So the stakers are not taking additional risks. But people building on this middleware are taking a governance risk because what if a legitimate slashing gets illegitimately vetoed? And so as you grow in trust when you build these new services, you've been tested in the wild, you can ossify yourself to another grade where you're not subject to this slashing veto. And so at that point, the stakers have to opt in. You have to convince them to opt in because they, they are losing one of their core protections, either by establishing reputation and you know, uh, testing yourself in the wild. So that's how we mitigate some of these risks. It necessarily requires exerting subjectivity. And I think this is one thing that you know, uh, the whole blockchain space should take more seriously, is how do we combine subjective mechanisms with credibly neutral mechanisms so that we can get the best of both worlds. Very good. All right. Um, <laughs> Back in the hot seat, you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Before I start answering, actually, I, I want to get a sense of what the room is composed of. So um, I will ask for a show of hands and, and, uh, and please participate. Um, anyone who's running Solo Validator at home, can you put your hand up? OK. Anyone who works for some? Professional node operator validator company. Put your hand up. All right, all right, a good chunk of you. Anyone who's building like validator middleware, sort of what we're talking about here, you can put your hand up. Okay, small group. It's what are you guys? It, this, this is the Obo crew. That's the whole Obo team. This yeah. Is yeah. Whole yeah. Team. Okay, okay. <laughs> Amazing. That's the fam over there. <laughs> um, anyone who's validating or staking on other networks, uh, put your hand up. Okay, cool. Um, all right, mostly mostly actually professional validators, which is which is interesting. Okay, so risks, um, MEV risk, MevBoost risks, um, and facts. I mean, at some point, risks no longer risk, and they become actual. Um, so in developing MevBoost, I think, and maybe any software really, it's easy to think about the first order risks, right? Like, what are the first order, you know, possible failure modes? Um, and uh, and you can sort of create a security model that says, okay, here are all the different ways in which the software could go wrong or get abused, etc. For MevBoost, this was threefold, right? So from the validator perspective, you are outsourcing part of your power to these third parties that are called relayers. Um, and there's three ways in which these relayers could start to misbehave. One of them is they produce a block that's just simply invalid, right? So you believe they're proposing a valid block to the network, but the block is invalid. The second one is that they can lie about the value of the block. So they'll say, hey, this block is worth 10 ETH, but in fact, it's only worth one ETH. Second way that they can misbehave. And the third way is that they could withhold the, the block. So they give you a block, you sign it, you return it, and then the relay just never reveals it to the network. And so it causes you to miss the miss slot. Um, so okay, you think about, okay, these are three different things that the counterparty is trusting um, is, is trusting. Um, what are the impact of that? And then how do you like start to mitigate them? Well, the validity one, right, is if, um, if a relay continues to produce invalid blocks over time, that's publicly known. And so you can see like this block, this valid, this, um, relayer is not behaving as it's expected to. I can simply disconnect from this. Um, and so the validator in this case has a power to be able to protect themselves from being, uh, sort of um, attacked. And they can also critically notice if this happens to other parties. 
So this is sort of a, a key part of the of the of the security model. You don't want a validator who is maybe going to propose like three blocks a year or something, right? To have to wait until the next block proposal to know that the counterparty that they're interfacing with is is uh, is malicious in some way. In some way, you need to be able to see it from the state of the entire network. For the third one and the block withholding one is the most difficult because there's this problem of attribution. Like you don't know if the relayer just revealed too slowly, if it's because the validator never like submitted their block to the relayer and they only submitted it to the, you know, to the rest of the network, there's a lack of attribution as to where the fault lies. Um, and these kinds of issues are the most difficult to solve when you're building software for validators. If you don't know which actor in the system the fault originates from, you can't mitigate it as effectively. And you have to look at these like wider uh, health metrics for the system. The, the solution for that specific risk is looking at, um, is the blockchain continuing to propose blocks? Um, and so you can have this health factor for the blockchain as a whole. If there's X percentage of the last you know, 100 slots that had a valid block proposal, then you can consider it to be good enough. If for whatever reason the health factor falls below some threshold, you have a circuit breaker in which it says it disconnects from all the middleware that could possibly be causing these kinds of faults, and you fall back to sort of a tried and, and trusted uh, operation of, uh, of the system. Okay, these are the first order risks. <laughs> Everyone's the following? But wait, there's more. This but is, wait. This is making what we do look a lot more simple. This is great. <laughs> We're the most complex thing on a panel, but this is, this is awesome. <laughs> All right, second order risk. So this is like the risks that aren't just directly from the behavior of a single node, right? But more risks are emergent from when you look at what if the entire blockchain is operating the same software? Right? What are the economics incentives? What what are like the marketplaces that get developed on top of this, and how does that impact the expected behavior of the software? I think this is where censorship is sort of comes into play. Right? So you can solve all of the micro sort of risk at the individual la layer while still having some bigger, broader risks that are more emergent out of the use of the entire system that can't be necessarily solved just through the the, the initial design. They sort of become second order effects, um, and some of them are easier to predict than others, um, and it's sort of a question of iterating on, on the ecosystem of the solution, both at the technical layer, but also at the industry level uh, to, to try to mitigate these. Yeah, and, and I think that you know, censorship is a, is a prime concern for uh, you know, the whole ecosystem right now, uh, and it's been a prime you know, topic of conversation throughout other panels and talks at DEF CON. Um, so yeah, we're all, we're all working on fixing it together. That's actually one of the things that Eigenlayer is often mentioned in uh, E3 search posts about like how it can support uh, potentially solving that problem. And so you, you guys talked about the individual risks uh, associated with each project, but then I want to go to the next question, which is that how do we deal with the amalgamated risk profile that results from using multiple middleware solutions? Why, why is that funny? That's amalgamated? A, that's that a nice word. I don't know if it's right, but it's good. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> This is, this is like a, I'm, I'm an immigrant, uh, and so we don't have preconceived notions about words. Like all words are equal to us. So I'm like, all English words are nice. I like them. Um, so where we're at here, like fact of the matter is, there's really only one predominantly used middleware, and it's NAV Boost. Um, so there will be many more, and we made it. We made it. <laughs> you like paved the way for all of us to see that it's actually you know doable. Um, so like today, there aren't combinations of middlewares happening. We actually recently integrated Caron, which is our client, into MEV Boost, uh, and now a distributed validator can propose blinded beacon blocks, which is cool. Um, so actually, that kind of opens up this new entire landscape where, like, um, a validator looking at the mempool, if there's 10 people in a validator, all 10 of them have a view on the mempool. Uh, and then that has, like, and since there's a consensus mechanism built inside of it, uh, that opens up, like, a whole new paradigm of not only what MEV looks like, but also, like, what security looks like. Uh, so we have validators uh, combined with MEV Boost running on testnet today. Um, we don't get to propose very often, um, but going through that process of testing it and figuring it out, um, fortunate for us, they came first. I like really don't think it would have been smooth if like DVT and MEV Boost launched at the same time. It was kind of the natural of getting to the merge. Let's get MEV Boost near mainnet. Let's change it from like a client into a middleware. Uh, it let's merge, and then after that, now we take on the next middleware, which is like DVT or others. 
Um, so I think doing them in phases as a community is like super important. I think the EF I kind of um, unknowingly designed it that way. And that's kind of how we interact with the client teams, for example. It's kind of like wait in line, you know, and your turn will come up. Yeah. Um, so now that we're seeing more middlewares come out and they're getting more use, uh, yeah, what happens when they sit on top of each other? Um, we've been looking at it less from the risk perspective and more from the opportunity perspective. Um, but through that finding, we'll probably find what, what the risks are. Yeah. And, I, and I'm glad you mentioned the, the client team angle. That's actually the next thing I want to talk about because I think it's super important. Okay. Any, any other takers on the amalgamator risk? Um, on the amalgamator opportunities, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I already mentioned, for example, that you know uh, you can do MEV type things on top of uh, eigenlayer. You know, that's one one set of opportunities. Another set of opportunities is can you build distributed validation for some of these other services built on top of eigenlayer? Because again, the same set of reasons why you would need DVT on top of a core layer also applies to services built on eigenlayer. So. That's, these are some of the touch points and interfaces. I think one nice thing is the core eigenlayer design is kind of as a sidecar. It's not directly uh, touching the client. So we are basically add-on, right? So opt-in, add-on, that's the two two aspects. But there are some touch points between these different uh, middlewares. One of the other interesting things to mention about eigenlayer and Opal is for like the long-term goal of this cryptography project is to deal with what's called the lazy validator problem. So today it's not like cryptographically possible to like objectively prove who in a threshold signing scheme was not doing their job. Um, so Eigenlayer can't fix that. That's more like moon math that can fix that. But then it comes down to how do you solve that once you can identify it. And that lazy person in that DVT cluster, you can disincentivize, you can punish, you can do a variety of different things. Today, the only way that the industry has thought about punishing that actor in our sense would be to like create a token, make everyone bond Obal token to the node, disincentivize, slash that token, and to your point, we, we would have to create our own trust network. So at the later tail of DVT in its more mature state, the goal is to be able to use cryptography so that a group of people can run a validator together and not know each other. They don't have to know each other. They don't have to trust each other. But to get there, you have to deal with the lazy validator problem. Uh, and today, the best way to do that is to create a new trust network, which is just, you know, 2017, 18 all over again. So there's like things that we would need for the later tale of what we're doing uh, that Eigenlayer is trying to build. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, please. Is it better if we like have a world where all the middleware solutions can sort of innovate, right? And like throw new ideas at the wall, figure out what happens and you know, what sticks, if it gets adopted, then, you know, it's just all core devs problem now and they like have to deal with it. Or should it be that um, each of these new middleware solutions have to figure out sort of their own governance mechanism over how to continue maintaining these and shipping new features and how does it fit with integrating into the principles of Ethereum into all the other uh, middleware solutions that get built? Is there like one path that's better than the other? By the way, I, I really regret showing Stefan the questions ahead of time. <laughs> so um, in uh, our case, uh, DVT... He's here to front run. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that's great. laughs> uh, so what was the question? <laughs> How do you feel about front running? <laughs> uh, his, his question was like, you know, you guys are all building really cool stuff. Um, but it's, you know, it's sidecars, it's like, you know, different clients. Uh, and so like, as we mentioned earlier, there's nine different clients that are, you know, either execution or consensus that are currently on the Ethereum blockchain. And now you have this slew of middleware solutions that aren't part of the all core devs, aren't part of the EIP process, are not part of any established rails by which the Ethereum community, you know, releases infrastructure, software, and, and upgrades. And so the question is like, how do you deal with that? Right. And like, do you try to, you know, do you just ship whatever you want and then just like, throw it at the, at the core devs and be like, it's your problem now? So um, ours was a reverse problem, actually. Um, I was part of a group of people who were focused on pre-genesis for ETH2. We spent a lot of time on like enablement, uh, onboarding, education. Uh, and then we began to focus on like uh, post-genesis problems. Um, and one of the first ones was stake centralization. And DBT started off as a research project at the EF. And then we worked with them to like build a reference implementation out of it. Uh, and then we took it on. And now it's basically our responsibility 
uh, as a project to like take that and push it forward. That's more, in my opinion, how the EF is being designed today is like, uh, if you want to be a real decentralized foundation, you probably can't ship too much code uh, when you get more mature. So like their job are to be like educators and business people uh, and um, reference implement, like, you know, do all the research, do the legal work, do the business work, enable a community uh, and push out technology that other people can take and run with. Um, it also ties to the economic scheme of how things work, right? The fact of the matter is, is that the client teams are funded uh, by the Ethereum Foundation and or in some cases, Joe. Uh, and now, you know, <laughs> middlewares um, are not anymore, right? We have our own private funding. Um, we're not relying on the EF. Our software doesn't need to be, it has to be open source, obviously, but it doesn't need to be free. Um, so that fact then creates a whole new world of like, yeah, the economic schemes of how it works because economics, incentives, and coordination will deem the, all relationships. Um, and at the base layer, the like the relationships and the client layer are straightforward. It's like virally left. Um, everyone can use it. It will be forever free. The EF has given them good chunks of money to do so. And now we're at a new layer and we get to create it uh, economically the way that we want to. Um, yeah, from our end, I think one of the things that has been lacking, I think already Colin alluded to, is economic models for people to build these new services. And that's something we, and the other issue that uh, Victor raised is the question of uh, whether these should be governance processes which bring on new things or should we let permissionless open competition. I'm very much on the side of like open innovation. We, I think if you look at the, the rate of innovation on the various layers of the blockchain stack, you would see that the rate of innovation we saw in the DAP layer is simply amazing you know you can take anybody else's ideas compose things on top and build new things whereas if you were a protocol dev there were very minimal opportunities for you to express your like engineering and building skills because the only way you could do it is to go and start a whole new network and what we need is mechanisms by which we can actually massively accelerate the rate of innovation at the core protocol layers because it's entirely log jamming the rest of the applications that can be built on top so we feel like as long as there is an attendant economic model to each of these middleware being built, or for example, on top of Eigenlayer, that would be collect a fraction of the fees and only the remaining fraction of the fees goes to the stakers. It could be, hey, you have a new token and you have dual staking. You, you, you stake your own token as well as you have each staked. So there could be a variety of different models in which uh, these middlewares can become self-sustaining. Um, but, I, but I do understand that there are um, some, some examples. For example, Flashbots has done a great job in stewarding MEV towards uh, away from things like multi-block MEV where thing, and reorgs where things can get quite hairy. And I think these should, the, the pressure on these things should be exerted socially rather than in terms of any kind of governance process. What about you? Yeah, I, I, I fall on, on that side of the camp. I think it's really tricky to design good uh, standards body, governance bodies over, you know, anything, but open source technology in particular. Um, I think we're very lucky that we have sort of a, an Ethereum core development ecosystem that's so committed to transparency and openness. Um, and it has allowed for a lot of these social consensus things to get expressed directly into how the protocol gets designed. Um, you know, all these wars and these arguments are having, uh, being had in the public can go away if there is this like formal process by which things get approved. Then the question is like, you know, what's acting and getting these things approved and like how it's, it's a completely different game that isn't necessarily about public dialogue and discourse and, um, and that's a big part of it. Um, I mean, you know, Victor, you, you helped out a lot in the development of, um, of an MEV solution, right? Like the, there was this um, ETH2 working group that essentially got started um, maybe this time last year. Um, to develop uh, the, the MEV boost solution and bring all the, the stakeholders in-house. In like, what, what do you think is the role of all these different stakeholders continuing forward? Is it like, you know, you vote with your feet, you decide which technology that you operate as a, as a node operator, which technology that you use, or should there be some more active process for involving, you know, those views and opinions? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, it's, it, it's hard to know, but I think that as infrastructure providers, 
what we want is by and large to be unopinionated in that we want to take open source software, we want to run it in the vanilla way in which it is designed, and we don't want to ever express opinions over the state of the network and like what is allowed or not allowed or censorship or, or any other properties. And so when we think about the designs of these various softwares, something that we think about is, you know, as infrastructure providers, we know how to run infrastructure really well. And so the things that we focus on are, you know, performance, our security, our like all these components that enable us to run great infrastructure. But when it comes to the characteristics of the design or the, the, the trade-offs um, that, the, uh, that the design makes, um, I think over there it becomes much more of a, of a conversation and a vote with your feet kind of thing. Um, and we actually, we, we did have a, a, a different MEV solution come and, come and talk to us and they, and they came to us and they uh, you know, explained their, des their design to me and I was like, that is completely uninteresting to me. And that's, that's something because they were like, well, I had 100% hit rate before I talked to you. And I'm like, yeah, well, here's why your idea is dumb and I'm not going to do it. Um, this is why Victor makes the big bucks. <laughs> Brut brutally honest. Yeah, I'm loving but direct. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that we, we, try, to, we try to influence uh, as, as much as we can in a way that still allows us to, you know, remain credibly neutral as infrastructure providers. But at the, at the end of the day, we have to make decisions. And I think that the decision that we make as infrastructure providers always have to be aligned with the long-term goals and health of the network. Uh, and if we're, if we're not doing that, then our business is dead and nothing matters. So, okay. We're, we're very much at time. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much for the speakers. Really appreciate you Thanks guys. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll be here if anybody wants to talk. Uh, and if not, we'll be outside. And if not, you can find us on Twitter and Telegram and all, all the things. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone.